If you were trapped in a death game and had to kill every single player to escape, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the escape room in head game. This woman is going to have the worst night of her life. Jackie here is ready for her date with a mysterious rich guy, and she's excited to see what he has planned. Her roommate can't believe how lucky she is and says goodbye to her friend, with no idea this is the last time they'll ever see each other. Later that night, the rich guy Chris is driving her back from the date, but that's when he asks if she wants to meet his friends. Eager to spend more time with him, Jackie takes the man on his offer and it's exactly what he wants to hear. They drive further away from the city and he brings her to this nightclub in the middle of nowhere, but something feels off. None of the guests know each other, and every single person has been brought as a date. It's sketchy as hell, but Chris here starts pouring them a vintage wine, while this woman begins to make a toast. She welcomes the group, revealing that all the guests were invited for a special reason, but nobody questions it as they all raise their glasses to drink. Jackie here is having the time of her life, but starts feeling dizzy, and before she knows it, the woman has passed out. Later, the woman wakes up inside a warehouse along with the other dates, and is horrified to discover that they've all had a camera lens installed directly to their foreheads. As the group tries to figure out what's going on, they suddenly hear a voice on the intercom. The announcer reveals that for the next 12 hours, they'll be trapped in this building and forced to play a death game. Their goal is to find a key and use it to unlock the exit, but there can only be one winner. Everyone is confused, but Mike here has heard enough. He walks over to this door to force it open, but it won't budge. Jackie screams that they won't play along, but the announcer ignores her. She explains that the cameras in their heads allow the audience to see what they see, and warns them not to tamper with it, or else they'll be tortured right on the spot. They're completely helpless, but Mike here refuses to cooperate and begins ripping the lens out of his head. As soon as he pulls it out, the man starts screaming in agony as something begins melting his face off. The others watch the man fall to the ground, horrified by the brutal punishment, and that's one down with eight more to go. The announcer reveals that in each of the cameras is a vial of acid that will kill everyone after 12 hours, and only the winner can have it removed. With that, the timer starts counting down, and the death game begins. Okay, Jackie here should have seen this coming. When a super rich guy asks you out on a date, anyone who's seen Fifty Shades of Grey should know that this could easily turn into something you weren't expecting. The first sign something was off was at the club, because instead of dancing with her, he was staring from the upstairs window like a casino boss. This is not normal behavior for a first date, and it's even creepier when you break down his friend's speech. She told them that every person was invited for a very special reason, but the implication is that they were all chosen for an agenda. It's clear that there's an ulterior motive here, and if Jackie had thought about her safety first, both of these signs should have been enough to call an Uber and get the f out of there before things get ugly. Now, at this point, it's too late. We're all stuck in a proper death game with a camera implanted into our heads, and if we block the cameras, they'll torture us, so the only way to escape is to play. With this in mind, the first thing I would do is figure out who the most dangerous players are so that we can take advantage of their weaknesses and use it against them. Luckily, there's a full 12 hours on the clock, so there's plenty of time to do this without risking our lives. For starters, Anton here is a personal trainer, but served in the South African military for five years. Soldiers are trained to identify threats and take them down, so that's exactly what I would use against him. If we can focus his attention on other players and make them look like threats, he's going to take them down, which gives us better odds of surviving. Keith is a con man. That means he's highly adaptable and excellent at reading people to give what he wants. If everything he says is a self-interested lie, then it's going to become clear to the other players that he can't be trusted. He's an excellent scapegoat when there's mistrust in the group, and that's the best way to use his skills against him. Leah here is a tennis pro, which means she's extremely competitive, and Jackson is a mountain climber. Their skills don't transfer well in a death game, but a competitive spirit means they'll do anything to get ahead, and that makes them dangerous. Fortunately, this also makes them vulnerable to reverse psychology because they'll always have a need to prove themselves superior, and that means we could potentially trick them into dangerous situations for our benefit. Now, the other players are much less dangerous. Nick here is a nice guy triathlete, Kat is a mute gymnast, Jackie is a yoga teacher, and Sarah here suffers from intense anxiety with no athletic ability whatsoever. 
gaining their trust is going to be the biggest difference maker in the game because it means we can use them to acquire strength in numbers and as long as we have a group majority supporting our decisions it will be a lot easier to manipulate everyone when it matters most but what they don't realize is that there is someone that they can always trust and that's today's sponsor surfshark vpn Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network that protects your computer and data from nosy ISP companies, big corporations, and hackers looking to kidnap you for a death game. By encrypting your data and switching the real location of your device to a new one, Surfshark secures all your private information so you can avoid getting trapped in deadly situations. You can connect to servers in over 65 countries on unlimited devices. You can even watch movies on Netflix that aren't available in your country, like The Girl with All the Gifts, which isn't available on Netflix in America, but all you have to do is connect to the Italy server using Surfshark and Grazie Mille, it's available. I might be covering it pretty soon, so use Surfshark to watch it and develop your own how to beat strategies against the hungry zombies before the video comes out. Don't want to use your friends and family as a meat shield? Unlike other VPNs that restrict the number of devices that you can use, Surfshark allows you to share your account with as many devices as you want. Click the link in the description and use my code Cinema Summary to get 83% off and 3 extra months for free. Try out this damn good deal with a 30 day money back guarantee. Looking around, Sarah finds an arrow painted on the floor, and with no better options, they follow it deeper into the warehouse. Meanwhile, Chris has been watching them, and he's already calculating their chances of survival. All of his friends have gathered together to place their bets, but the winner is not going to be who they think. In the escape room, they discover this strange box in the middle of the room. Nobody knows what to expect, and Jackie here opens it, discovering something that will change the game. Inside is a machete, and it's clearly been placed here for them to kill each other. The woman suggests they leave the blade behind, but the personal trainer disagrees and steps forward to grab it. Paranoid, the mountain climber confronts him, and they get into a heated argument about what to do. The trainer insists it's their only way out, and if they don't start killing each other, everyone will die. But the climber here has heard enough. He suddenly pushes Jackie out of the way and jumps for the machete, but gets punched hard in the face and drops the weapon. Picking it up, the trainer scares off the other players and approaches the climber, swinging the machete straight into his neck for his first kill. That's now two down, with seven more to go. The others quickly run out of the room, and as the trainer calms himself down, he turns to see the tennis player approaching. She tells the man they should team up to kill the others, but that's when they notice Keith here sneaking in the shadows, and he's just overheard everything. Okay, this is getting interesting. We aren't just in a death game, it's also an escape room, and that makes the scenario extremely challenging. Because every other player is a threat to our survival, but we can't solve the puzzles without them. Earlier, the voice on the intercom said we have to find a key inside of this maze, and the more people we have to help us, the more successful we're going to be. Now, the machete puts this plan at serious risk, because someone like Anton here will want to kill people as soon as possible. We have to get control of this situation quickly, so if it were me, I would try to convince everyone that they're falling right into the death game's trap. We should suggest that the designers want us to eliminate players, making it harder for us to find the key so that nobody will win. This speaks directly to everyone's self-interest in being the last and only person to escape, and it's going to make them think twice before killing someone. I would also acknowledge that eventually this machete is going to be useful as either a weapon or a tool for solving puzzles, and that means we should bring it with us. I'd suggest that the weakest member of the group should hold it, because Sarah here is the least threatening player, and nobody believes she has it in her to kill them. Once everyone agrees that it's in their mutual interest to work together, this is where we can start playing tricks on them. The social dynamic is going to get progressively more tense as the clock counts down, and we need to use this tension to our advantage. The best way to do this is to make sure we take this conflict and focus the negative attention onto a scapegoat. Nothing unites a group stronger than fear, and if we plant this seed early, we can turn it against Anton. He was the most eager to kill, and reminding people of this is going to help us convince everyone that he should be the first person to murder. We can take this strategy one step further and have private conversations with other players to stir up fake drama, giving them each an enemy. For example, if I told Leah here that Nick said she was the most dangerous player and that we would all be fools to let her live, her aggression would be focused on Nick for the rest of the game. Meanwhile, the others take a moment to catch their breaths, but Sarah here starts to panic. Jackie reassures her that they'll make it out alive, but that's when this guy notices a series of holograms on the floor. 
They look like baseballs. And realizing these must be clues to the escape room, the group decides to follow the trail. They continue further into the maze, but the man triggers a laser and something hits him in the head. The woman checks on him to make sure he's okay, and the athlete realizes that he was just hit with a baseball bat. He grabs it to bring with them, but Jackie asks him not to kill anyone with it, and he promises that he won't. They continue walking through the maze when they find the path ahead splitting into three hallways. Each of them have been marked with holograms showing a police badge, a music note, and a pair of sunglasses. Interpreting the signs, they think the glasses represent sunlight, and this could mean it leads to the exit. Making their decision, the group walks forward with no idea they're heading right into another trap. Across the warehouse, the other team has entered a room full of keys hanging from the ceiling. Discovering a door nearby, Keith grabs a handful of keys and tries them out on the lock, but none of them seem to work. This one thinks that the room must be a trick designed to waste their time, and the trainer kicks the bucket in frustration as they walk out the door leaving Keith behind. But this was their mistake. He sees something on the floor and realizes it's a metal spike. It could easily be used to kill someone, and concealing his new weapon, he follows after his teammates. The group heads through the maze, hoping to ambush the other players, but they never notice that someone is hiding on top of the wooden pallets, watching their every move. They find their way to the junction and aren't sure which path to take, but that's when the tennis player spots a clump of hair on the ground. It's a sign that the others went this way and leads her team to chase them down. Meanwhile, Jackie's team find their way in front of this corridor and hear a strange whistling sound in the distance. She warns them something is flying across the hallway and looking closer. They realize nails are being shot through the pallets. This is a death trap, but the woman figures out that there are lights that turn on in a specific pattern. She thinks something valuable might be on the other side and quickly comes up with a plan, telling the man to memorize the exact sequence the lights appear. Testing their theory, the group runs down the corridor, staying in the light, and narrowly avoid being shot to death. Okay, this escape room is a lot bigger than I thought. If you look at the clock, they've already been wandering around for over 6 hours, and it tells us we're going to waste valuable time if you aren't thinking ahead. If they were me, the first thing I would do is have the group split up to explore each of these three pathways, because it's going to reveal more of the maze, and there might be weapons or resources that we can gather when we join back up. Not taking this opportunity is going to seriously limit our options, and it was a huge mistake. Now, the group didn't notice Cat here spying on them, but if they did, they would have some extremely useful information on their hands. Cat has climbed on top of the wooden pallets to avoid the traps, but what's shocking is that she hasn't been punished for it. This this tells us that the rules are fluid, and it's up to us to find out more about what we can and cannot do. One of the best strategies in any death game is to find a safe way to test the boundaries so we know what our options are. The first thing I would do is encourage someone athletic to climb up the wall, because if we can see above the maze, we won't risk walking to any more traps. For these players, if they do something wrong, they're going to be tortured as a warning, and that's a lot better than instant death, so it's worth a try. This way of thinking would be the simplest, most effective tool we have to hack this game, and it gives us a huge advantage over the other group. Now, one possible problem with this strategy is that the game makers could decide to change the rules if everyone figures out how to bypass the maze. If that happens, we need a better solution for the traps that we're going to encounter because they're only going to get more dangerous. With this in mind, I would suggest someone climb up the wall and remove some wooden pallets from the top so we can use them as shields. Jackie here was smart to figure out that the light was telling them which row they would be safe with, but this isn't enough. Solving a puzzle is pointless if we can't execute it well, and if anyone trips or we miss our target by as little as 6 inches, we're going to be killed. We need to consider backup strategies for every situation, and these wooden pallets are the perfect solution. In another part of the escape room, Cat here walks through the maze, and she finds the hologram of the police badge. Following the path, she discovers a hallway leading to a set of lockers, and it must be the next clue. Approaching them, the woman spots the badge symbol on the front and carefully opens them one by one. But as soon as the last door opens, a gun fires straight at her head. Meanwhile, Jackie's team discovers a flashlight on the ground, and Sarah picks it up to look for more clues. The yoga teacher notices something strange and shines it on the floor, revealing two hidden symbols of keys. It's a black light, and with these clues, they're one step closer to escaping. Following the trail, the group enters a room and finds one last clue placed right in front of this hole in the floor. Jackie looks around and sees a key hanging from the ceiling. 
this might be what they need to escape, and she climbs up a ladder determined to reach it. Carefully moving across the support struts, she takes the key in her hand and tosses it to her teammate, but that's when things go horribly wrong. The trainer comes walking out of the shadows and attacks the athlete. The key falls to the ground and Sarah picks it up, running for the ladder. She climbs up the safety trying to escape from the other team, but the woman can't hold on for much longer and falls off the support strut. Horrified, Jackie screams and loses her balance, hanging on for dear life until she drops to the floor. Keith goes downstairs to the basement and finds Sarah laying on the ground. He takes the key from her hand, but she suddenly wakes up. The woman begs him for help, and he decides to finish the girl off, officially making that three down with six more to go. The man quickly leaves and tries to head back to the door, but his teammate suddenly grabs him. The trainer demands to know where the key is, and Keith tells him that he hasn't checked the body, but the man knows something is wrong. The tennis player searches the corpse, but the only thing she finds is the flashlight. She tells her teammates the key is missing, and Keith suggests the other players must have already taken it, but the woman points out he was the only person to come down the stairs and realizes that he's lying. Confronting him, the trainer holds the man back while she checks his pockets and discovers the metal spike that he was going to use to kill them. With no key, the woman decides they don't need him anymore, and Keith runs for his life as the trainer chases after him. Okay. For a con man, this guy's a pretty bad liar. The room is a wide open space where everyone could see what was happening, and since Keith here was the first man down the stairs, they knew he would have taken the key. Even a 7 year old wouldn't tell a lie this obvious, and it was a terrible mistake. Now, that's not to say that giving them the key would be a good idea either, because the problem is, as soon as they get what they want, they have no reason to keep you alive. That's why if it were me, I would have admitted that I have the key, but told them that I can recognize the type of door handle it belongs to. If you look at this key in detail, it has a unique blade, and it's only going to work with a specific kind of lock, so they might be convinced that a con man would know this information. This would make me indispensable to them, because even if it's a lie, they might keep me alive if they thought there was a chance we could find the door faster. Now, that's not the only mistake that these players are making, because once again, they aren't even thinking about their environment. First of all, this place has a lot to offer because it's full of objects that could be used as weapons, but what's even more interesting is that this entire wall is made of glass. If these idiots had stopped fighting and looked around, they'd see that there were tons of exits around the entire room that didn't need keys, and it's the closest they've been to escaping since the game began. It's obviously a risk to try running away because the game designers can see everything through our head cameras, but that just means we need to get creative. If you look here, you'll see that there's a bridge-like structure, and the speed and trajectory of this passing object tells me it's a passing car. That means this warehouse is actually close to civilization, and possibly even on the outskirts of a city. Now, earlier I mentioned that I would have made the group split up when we reached the three pathways, and if we did this, it's possible that we could have taken this gun here with us. If it's a standard issue police pistol, it might be a Beretta, and with three bullet casings in the locker, there could be anywhere from 7 to 12 bullets still inside. Instead of running out the door risk getting killed, I'd use the gun and shoot out of the window to hit cars and traffic. If we're lucky, it might draw the attention of law enforcement to investigate the warehouse. There doesn't seem to be any other CCTV monitors throughout the maze, so as long as everyone is pointing the cameras away from the action, the game designers won't know what we're doing, and it's worth trying. With three hours remaining, Jackie suddenly wakes up, but as she recovers from the fall, the woman sees her dead teammate. The yoga teacher starts crying, but hears someone sneaking behind her and turns around to see another player. It's the mysterious woman, Kat, and both contestants are ready for a fight, but deciding to take pity on her, she drops her weapon. Jackie is relieved that she means no harm, and suggests they work together to find her friend Nick. Meanwhile, Keith has managed to survive, but his leg has been badly cut, and he hides in a room away from the other players. He tries to take a drink from this leaking pipe, but discovers that it's not filled with water at all. Throwing the key in frustration, he takes a moment to catch his breath when he hears someone approaching in the distance, and moments later, the women enter his room. Looking around, they find the key on the floor and take it. They can finally escape this place, but as they celebrate, Keith comes out of hiding. It takes the women by surprise as he pulls out a metal bar and a rock. He reveals they're standing in a puddle of gasoline and is about to spark a fire when he's suddenly stabbed from behind. The women stare in shock as they see that Nick has killed the man to save their lives, making that four down with only five more to go. 
in another part of the maze. The other players find the exit door, but when the woman tries the handle, she discovers it's locked shut. They're trapped, but she knows everyone will be heading here to escape, so all they need to do is wait until the survivors come to them. Jackie's group moves deeper into the building, finding a safe place to hide, and Kat tells her teammates that she's going to look around. The yoga teacher makes her promise to come back, and the woman hands over the key as insurance that she won't betray them. Letting her go, Jackie tends to the man's wound and wraps it up with her shirt. She joins him on the bench, thanking him for saving her life, but is disappointed he broke his promise not to kill. The man makes it clear that he would do anything to protect her, and she kisses him. Time is running out for everyone, and they take comfort in each other, knowing that soon, they'll be fighting for survival. Okay, right now there's only 5 players left in the game, and that means it's time to get vicious. Jackie here doesn't have the strength to fight for her life, but thankfully, there are a lot of other survival tools at our disposal, and one of them is love. Now what's interesting is that dangerous situations have been proven to increase someone's arousal, and this is known as the suspension bridge effect. Emotions like anxiety and love feel extremely similar to each other, and when you're in a death game, it's easy to get these feelings mixed up. Clinical psychologists call this misattribution of arousal, and in 1979, they proved this in one of the most groundbreaking experiments in its field of study. They took 85 male subjects and had them meet a female interviewer on two different bridges. One was stable, and the other was a shaky suspension bridge. What they found was that the subjects on the shaky bridge were more likely to call the female interviewer's phone number the next day. This demonstrated that anxiety makes people more attractive when exposed to dangerous situations. Whether she knows Knows it or not, Jackie here is taking advantage of this man's emotional confusion and manipulating it to make sure he won't kill her. It's a great tactic. And if I were in her position, I would have tried using this strategy a lot earlier. There were three other men in the game, and if we used moments of heightened fear and anxiety to suggest attraction, then they all might have given a second thought before trying to kill us. Not everyone has the same physical abilities as a triathlete or a military man, so we have to use every tool we have at our disposal, and it was the smartest decision for her to make. Jackie and the athlete fall asleep, but are woken up by Kat who insists they follow her. Leading them back into the maze, they see the opposing players waiting for them, and the group quickly comes up with a plan. Since the others want the key, the man suggests Jackie use it as bait and lure the trainer away from his partner so that Nick here can kill him. The woman points out that their enemies think she's dead, so if she switches clothes with Kat, they can confuse the players and ambush them. With the plan set, Jackie distracts the other team, and the trainer gets up to chase after her. He follows the woman deeper into the warehouse, while Kat here goes to confront the tennis player. The woman hits her with a nightstick and knocks her opponent to the ground. Both of them know only one person is getting out of this alive, and they'll do anything to survive. Meanwhile, Jackie runs into a room, hiding behind some furniture as the trainer walks in looking for his target. Suddenly, she takes him by surprise and dumps a bucket of gasoline all over his body. Her friend Nick tries to start a fire and burn him, but he's too slow. The trainer slashes him across the back, and he falls to the ground. It's almost too much pain to bear, but seeing the woman in danger, he uses the last of his strength to light the gasoline. The open flames move towards the trainer and climb up his body. Jackie backs away, horrified to see him burned alive, and he collapses to the floor dead, making that five down with four more to go. That's when Jackie comes back into the room. She runs over to him, picking the man off the floor so they can escape together, but things won't go according to plan. In the other room, Kat strangles the tennis player and it looks like she might kill her, but the woman takes the metal spike out of her pocket before stabbing it straight into the player's head. That's six down, with only three more to go. She gets back up and searches the dead woman's clothes for the key. Finding it, she crawls over to the door and tries to unlock the exit, but it doesn't work. That's when Jackie approaches her from behind, and the two of them face each other, prepared to fight to the death. Seeing the nightstick in the dead woman's hands, the tennis player tries to go for the weapon and gets decapitated in one swing, making that seven down with only two more to go. Okay, Nick managed to save his girlfriend by setting the man on fire, but they both missed a crucial detail, because they could have used this to end the game with more than one winner. If it were me, I would have tried setting the warehouse on fire, because it's easily one of the most effective tools you can use to signal for help. We have a pretty good idea that we're in an urban environment, and if the place goes up in flames, it's probably going to alert the local fire department. Once that happens, it will take them less than 20 minutes to show up, and since we still have 3 hours on the clock, this could have saved everyone. 
Now, to be fair, this is an extremely risky strategy because we have to consider what the game designers would do if they found out that we're burning down the warehouse. It's possible that this strategy will force them to abandon the death game, and since we've all seen their faces, they probably wouldn't let any of us live. But there's one thing we can do to prevent this. First of all, we have to assume that they're smart enough not to be watching from the same location because they wouldn't want to put themselves at risk. And if their only way of observing the game is through these head cameras, we can make sure we're not allowing them to see what we're up to, but only if we work together. When the announcer on the PA told them the rules, she said that if they obstruct their vision in any way, they'll be tortured with a high-pitched sound. While it's going to be very painful, I would suggest that we all cover our cameras and subject ourselves to the torture. That way, we can safely light the fire without the designers knowing and have enough time to leave the room. It's important to remember that even if we win the game, we've already seen their faces, and there's no way that they'll let us go back to our normal lives. That means calling for outside help is still the best option we have, and as risky as it is, it has a higher chance of success than anything else. With time running out, the yoga teacher tries to force the door open, but the athlete reminds her that she'll be trapped until only one survivor remains. He needs to die for her to escape, and asks the woman to kill him, but she refuses to let that be their only option. Desperate, the woman tries to figure out what to do when the door suddenly slides open. They can both escape, but that's when she sees her friend has passed away, making her the final survivor, and she leaves the warehouse. That's eight down, and Jackie is the winner of this death game. Outside, she cries in relief that she made it out alive. That's when her date Chris comes out to congratulate the woman, and she passes out from exhaustion. When Jackie wakes up, she's in someone's bedroom and is surprised to see Chris sitting nearby. He reassures her that she's safe, but the only thing the woman cares about is knowing why he forced her into a death game. Chris explains that he's part of an elite group who literally gamble with people's lives. Every member is a survivor of these tournaments, and she's officially joined their group after last night. The woman doesn't understand, but that's when she remembers going to a hillside and using a machete to cut off a man's head. It's a repressed memory of her initiation ceremony and she screams for help, unable to cope with the situation. Later, she tries to leave the room and finds Chris's friends waiting for her. They promise to let Jackie go free, but reveal that her roommate was murdered and the police think she did it. The gamblers framed her for a crime, making it clear nothing will save her from going to jail, and the woman closes the door, determined to find a way to escape. That night, Jackie spends time with the rich guy and asks him why he doesn't bet. He explains his job is to run the game, and she questions if she'd be allowed to help him. The woman knows that sticking with the man is the best way to stay safe, and that means doing everything she can to get on Chris's good side. She tries to seduce him, but the man brushes her off, explaining it doesn't excite him anymore. Desperate for her plan to work, she asks Chris what turns him on, and he reveals this vial. It's the chemicals they use to put the players to sleep, and he has no idea Jackie has everything she needs to get her revenge. Later, the woman drives her date to the club, where the other gamblers have gathered for their next death game, and they all take a sip of their drinks, but that was their biggest mistake. The players are taken to the warehouse, and the club members wake up, realizing they've been tricked. Jackie announces over the intercom that they don't have long to live, and there's nothing they can do to escape their fate. She leaves them to die together, and Chris can't help but think he should have swiped left. But what do you think? How would you beat head game? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and thank you again to Surfshark VPN. Check them out in the link in the description, and have a damn good day.